Hi, everybody. Welcome to week seven. Um, so we've had a chance last week to talk about quality and to think about statistical process control. Um, but this week, we're going to kind of take another step back to think more fundamentally about the processes that we use, um, the technology, the equipment that we're using, and how do we think about whether or not that's the right equipment, the right technology, or the right process? And how do we think about changing those processes to better support our, whether it's growth, um, increased capacity, quality requirements, cost requirements, uh, com customer needs for flexibility, all of those things should encompass how we're thinking about setting up and revising our processes. So there are a few different types of um, basic process strategies that we can think about. Um, not all organizations fit nice and neatly into one of these four that we'll talk about. Generally, most organizations fall somewhere on this continuum. Um, so at a very basic level, so if we think about this image, um, and this is, again, coming straight from the text, so you can follow through um, in uh, chapter seven in the text. So as we think about process strategy, the kind of the oldest process strategy that existed is one of a job shop um, where there is very low volume, right? You're not pumping out a, a ton of parts, um, but there's a lot of variability in terms of the specific needs of different components and having things done in kind of a craft or skilled um, kind of a way. So this is your typical machine shop, but we can also think about hospitals and falling into this category because again, Every patient is going to be different, so there's a lot of variability, and you have to have processes that support having a lot of different options and people with different specialties coming in to be able to support the needs of that patient. So when we think about those circumstances where, again, there's low volume, high, high variety, um, either in industry or in a service, um, in typical manufacturing or in a service industry, that's going to be more of your job shop. That is what we call a process focus um, because there's basically a lot of different paths that either the product or the patient who the customer can take in order to get um, a, a product or a service that's basically customized to their needs. So the next step up would be something called repetitive, where um, for the most part, everybody is receiving either the same product or service, um, but there might be some small changes in terms of the type of um, product or this type of service that they're receiving. This is what we might refer to as repetitive. Another name for this is also cellular manufacturing, which is essentially a system in which there are maybe a few particular cells or departments that are capable of either making a product or delivering a service, and they focus on being able to do that one component. So if we think here about Harley-Davidson, there would be you know, a section where kind of the motor is built, and depending on what kind of a, a, a motorcycle you're getting, right, there's, there's a lot of different variations of that. So you would have all of these different cells, basically, that are capable of um, bringing in some variety, but for the most part, they're, they are standardized. Um, so, so again, we've got these different cells with these different modules that are capable of making things um, that have you know, some variety or some differences to them, but um, we start to see that volume starts to pick up a little bit. So again, this is, this is what we call repetitive or cellul cellular manufacturing. And then at the furthest end of the spectrum is what we have as the product focus. And that's where you've got very high volume very um, low variety in terms of the goods. So we can think about our, our kind of traditional um, high-speed production facilities. So your Frito-Lay, your Anheuser-Busch, where you're basically pumping out um, at a large scale uh, one specific product um, over and over again, running 24-7. Again, that's product focus, and that's what we tend to think of, again, as kind of that high-speed manufacturing process. So there is one more version, um, which is mass customization. And that is trying to bring together the best of both worlds where you are being able to, to produce things at a high volume, but also incorporate quite a bit of um, variety. So we can think about Dell Computer, which is you know, kind of high-speed manufacturing, but they're able to kind of pull in based on some, um, some newer technology, a lot of different variations in terms of customer needs, in terms of how they're, you know, the, the hardware of the different computers that they're pulling in are specific patient or, or customer needs. Um, there are a few other examples out there now that we're starting to see more and more of this mass customization pop up. We can think about Nike ID shoes where, um, you know, obviously uh, these sneakers are still being kind of mass produced, but you're able to go in and pick your own design. So you're able to, you know, the customer can go out and pick, um, 
for any given shoe, they can pick whatever you know color or material they want, or even pick out whatever color swoosh, swoosh they want, um, and shoelaces, right? So there's a lot of customization that can start, that is being pulled into these otherwise kind of high-speed production processes. Another really interesting example um, that is, is a little bit newer is specifically with eyeglasses. Um, there are a couple new companies out there, Warby Parker is one of them, um, that is taking a different approach to the eyeglass industry. Another one is Zenny. Um, you can go to zennyoptical.com, and uh, what they're able to do is basically you take a picture of yourself or you put in measurements in terms of the distance um, between your eyes, and you're able to upload an image of yourself and basically customize frames to make sure that the width is going to be appropriate for your face, to make sure that they have all of the right specifications in terms of your prescription need. You've got options to put in all different types of things for your lenses, but also and finding frames that um, are also going to be customized to fit your face, right? So that again is another example of mass customization where they're bringing in technology that's going to you know, enable them to produce these glasses at a lower price point, but also make sure that they're customized to, to customer needs needs. So as we think about um, what, pro what process strategy is going to be the best for us, um, I think a lot of companies start off in kind of this job shop kind of approach where um, you're just trying to, to pull together, you know, some different people that are skilled at doing a particular job, um, if you've got an idea for a new product. But if we can even think about um, about companies, let's say, that go on Shark Tank, right? So a lot of these people started from the ground up, they had a job shop, they were making it work, making their product, and they go to the sharks because they're looking for an investment to be able to build out their production facility, right? Then we can think about, they're looking to get some investors to take them to that next step to where they'd probably be in some sort of modular or repetitive, uh, repetitive uh, or cellular production process. Um, and then there's a next step where you can think about if they're successful on that role, then do they need additional equipment to be able to get them to either mass customization or some sort of um, product, you know, focused strategy. So all of that costs money to be able to get the right equipment, the right people, the right investing investment funds or support to be able to get to that level. So we can think about as we're starting off trying to figure out what process strategy is going to be best for us is a function of the total fixed cost of that equipment that we would need to be able to move into one of those different kind of process strategies. Um, we also need to understand then what the cost is associated with, with each product using that sort of um, process strategy. And then that can inform us based on the volume at which we anticipate we'll be selling our product for, what process strategy is going to be the best for us. So in this example, we can think about, you know, using the, the Zenny eyeglass example, we can think about, you know, one process strategy would be, again, just taking the job shop, right? There's an initial investment of, say, $200,000, and that's going to mean that you're able to produce each pair of glasses for about $60. So you basically just take that equation, $200,000, that total fixed cost, plus $60 for each pair of glasses. Right, that's our equation, and our volume there is just basically our x in this equation because we're not sure what that um, what that volume number is going to be yet, and we compare that to the next step up. So let's say that the next step up would be doing some sort of kind of cellular manufacturing process, and that would require an initial investment of, of about four hundred thousand dollars for that equipment or that setup, plus. $40, so that's going to be the cost per pair of glasses times whatever, again, that, that total volume is. So you're basically setting these two equations equal to one another, and then you're going to solve for X. So if you did do that, right, you minus the $200,000 over underneath the $400,000, you minus the 40 under the, the 40X, um, 60X minus the 40X, that's going to give you basically 20X equals $200,000, solve for X. In this case, that volume point is going to be 10,000 pair of glasses. So what that means is that it's going to be most economical to go with that kind of job shop, you know, just kind of making it work while you can with a very low initial investment. That's going to work if you are only anticipating you're going to sell less than 10,000 pairs of glasses. If you think you're going to exceed that 10,000 pair of glasses, then you're going to want to consider moving up to that next kind of making that next investment um, to kind of going with that cellular um, process strategy. You can do the same thing then. So then the next step would be taking that, that modular, that cellular manufacturing process and setting that equal to that mass customization investment, which would be 
an initial fixed cost of about $750,000, but again, that's going to bring the cost of each pair of glasses down to about $15. You set those two equations equal to one another and solve for x again, which in this case will give you 14,000. So again, that means that that cellular or modular process is gonna be most economical if you are going to plan to produce anywhere from 10,000 up to 14,000 pairs of glasses. But if you think you're gonna exceed that $14,000 mark, you're gonna to wanna to go to the sharks and you're gonna to wanna to ask for an investment of about $750,000 to get you the right equipment to be able to take that next step. So again, it's really important to understand these, these fixed costs, um, what that variable cost is going to be for each one of your products, and then that's going to inform your decision about what kind of an investment in, in equipment are you going to need to make. So all of that um, comes down to trying to understand what technology and equipment is available. Obviously, you want to create, as always in all of these modules, the best competitive advantage, which again, you can achieve through cost, um, differentiation, or response to your customers. And you know, because you can invest in you know, some sort of really sophisticated technology, but is that, again, going to give you, help you move along, to, you know, get a little bit closer to achieving that competitive advantage? Um, if not, then that investment is not going to make sense in your case. And that's something that, again, if, right, if you were the shark sitting on the other side of the table, that you would be kind of assessing what the need is, what the um, projected sales are going to be, and what kind of equipment or technology is going to be best to support that business. So some of the production technology that's available, um, obviously there are CNC machines, there's 3D printing, depending on what type of industry you're in. Um, RFID solutions and vision systems are becoming increasingly, um, increasingly utilized. So we see them in you know, potentially grocery stores and in retail outlets. Um, we also see vision systems in hospital systems. So we have, um, I work with a number of hospitals that have on their, um, on their you know, physician, all of their team member tags basically have an RFID chip in them and they have vision systems that are embedded into the ceiling so we can see you know, when a caregiver walks up to the sink to wash their hands, it will determine um, how long they're actually washing their hands for and after 15 seconds, they'll get a green light to say, okay, you've successfully washed your hands, which may sound silly and like big brother, but it also has been proven to reduce um, hospital acquired infections. So there's all kinds of, and we can see that with patients too, right? We have bands for babies um, in, the, in the newborn units um, that would set off an alarm if they were to be taken out of, um, off the floor. Um, we have that with other patients where they can, you know, within their bands, we can see how they progress from the emergency department to an inpatient floor to their trip to radiology so that we can start to understand patient flow and movement uh, throughout the system. So obviously robots are being um, increasingly utilized in um, sort of that kind of uh, that product, um, that product uh, process strategy and, and high-speed manufacturing is, is um, ASRS's automated storage and retrieval systems, which basically is a way to manage um, inventory, especially for preventative maintenance. So you've got little parts that you need to have on hand. Um, obviously, you, you want to be able to access these things, but not have to require on these huge rate uh, warehouses or warehouses to, to store them. And ASRS basically is um, an automated system that is, you know, several stories high that basically has a robot that will go up and pull out exactly what you need when you need it. Um, AGVs, automated guided vehicles, we're seeing more and more um, of these. And for those of you that go on the Anheuser-Busch tour, we will see AGVs um, in use in the warehouse there. So aside from thinking about what technology is right to support your process, we also want to think about the actual process that we're using, so process redesign. Process redesign is the fundamental rethinking of business processes to bring about dramatic improvements in performance. Again, the goal is to think about our competitive advantage. Why do we do what we do, and is there a way we can structure our process to do it a little bit better? And this is a lot of when we bring in lean concepts and philosophies in terms of thinking about specifically the current state, our processes, and thinking about what we want to achieve, where the waste is in our process, and trying to revamp that system to enable us to um, achieve either higher quality or lower cost. So as we think about our, our current processes that we use, we want to focus in on waste specifically. And the acronym that we use to remember this is typically TIMWOOD. And there is an eighth waste, which is also brought in um, a lot, which is talent. And um, you know, there's also waste in not being able to utilize the expertise um, and the problem-solving skills of your team members. Um, aside from that, 
the, the seven common ways Tim would are associated with transporta transportation, so unnecessary movement of products or materials, inventory, so having a lot of inventory on hand can hide defects, can hide problems, and obviously is not creating a lot of um, pull within our system, which we want to see to be have our systems and processes be responsive. M, which is motion, um, and that's just kind of unnecessary movement and walking, not having things easily accessible. W is associated with waiting, wasted time waiting for the next step in a process. There are two O's over production and over processing. So producing more than you're needed or producing um, more work or higher, higher quality that's required by the customer. And then the last is D for defects. So those are all of the, the eight ways or seven ways if you just wanna go with Tim Wood um, that we focus on as we start to redesign our processes. Um, these are the pieces that we wanna focus on trying to remove from our processes. So as we're redesigning our, our, our processes, we like to use process mapping, value stream maps, which I'll talk through very quickly. But what we tend to see is if we break out those value added activities, when we're actually doing something that's of value to the customer, that the customer would pay for, that is value added. Everything else is waste and would fall into one of the categories of Tim Wood. So oftentimes what we see is if we map out and if we actually time our value added versus our non-value added steps in a process, the value added usually only account for about 20% of, of the time spent in a process. So our goal is not to do those value added activities faster, but it's to get rid of all of that waste in the system. So as we start to understand our current um, process and try to redesign the system, there are three different types of, of maps that we can use. We can use a swim lane diagram, and this is a diagram where basically each lane in the swim lane is associated with a different worker in the process. Um, and this illustrates typically handoffs, um, and we do tend to see a lot of errors um, with um, increased handoffs. So this type of map, um, again, illustrates all of that, you know, that handoff, that back and forth between different individuals or systems within a process. We've got our traditional process map. Um, and while this is this tends to be really high level, it's kind of a good starting place for people um, to understand the current condition of the process helps you understand where those decision points are, um, but also illustrates where those kind of key inputs are needed for some more detailed problem solving. And last but not least is something called a value stream map, and this is where we specifically try to break out just those those activities or those steps in the process that are adding value from the customer's perspective. And on the bottom, we basically keep track of what are those steps that are value added and what is the time in between those value added steps, which is non-value added work. Um, and then we try to revamp and, and re, um, rethink our processes to, to try to reduce that, that waste in the process, always making sure that we're doing and designing our processes to be effective and efficient. So again, the value stream app really calls out the, those value added versus non value added activities. So um, this again is just a quick primer on process strategy. We're going to pick up in the next video on thinking about capacity.